their test. So thank you very much for coming. Can everybody hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of slides of presentation. Indeed, I have not my badge, so please let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Valerio. Well, that's me, of course. I'm indeed half of me. Um, I'm PhD, I have PhD in computational science, and I'm currently a postdoc researcher at the University of Salerno in Italy. I'm I can define myself a data scientist, whatever it means. And, of course, I'm also a very geeky person, so I like all the stuff. And please don't ask me to fix your computer, but I'm quite sure that you'll never ask me that. Um, yeah, let's get serious. So these are something, some of the topics I work, uh, current, usually work on. I work with uh, machine learning algorithm, formation retrieval, text mining in general. And I um, recently joined the team in Salerno working with linked data and semantic web data uh, technologies, very interesting. And I usually apply all this stuff to the software. So in, in fact, my main research field is uh, software maintenance. Um, and so I basically apply machine learning algorithms to the source code and the analysis of the source code. And of course, I do all this stuff with Python, so you might prefer the programming language. And these are more or less all the tools I use basically uh, every day. In particular, uh, the machine learning tools I use the most and I like also the most are this one. And these are all the tools I'm going to talk in, uh, in a few minutes. So um, let's get to the point. Machine learning and the test. So what? So, uh, the presentation is more or less organized in two different parts. In the first one we're going to, uh, to, 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 to understand what should be common risks and pitfalls related to machine learning and machine learning models or at least I'll try to introduce some of the topics you should uh, uh, see uh, about this kind of things. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about testing machine learning code, what actually uh, it means and what tools I'm required to use. So please, um, before we start, please let me ask you three questions. Uh, first of all, do you already know machine learning? How many of you? Oh, fantastic. So you're all uh, perfectly suited for this talk. And do you already know use here about testing or test-driven development? Yeah. And have you ever used like it, learn from machine learning? Okay, perfect. So I'm trying to uh, skip all uh, the introductory part. So basically what machine learning is. Uh, this is one of the most common definition of machine learning uh, that says that machine learning is a systematic study of algorithms and systems that improve the knowledge and performance with experience. I took this definition because uh, this definition points out a very interesting part of the machine learning, the algorithmic part. So at glance um, so basically, machine learning means writing algorithms and writing code. At a glance, machine learning should look like this. Uh, so basically, it's algorithms, uh, data, and statistics. So in a few words, in, in a nutshell, machine learning should be summarized as, as algorithms that should run on data. And from our point of view, I mean from the point of view of this talk, uh, we should deal with algorithms that uh, we should deal with the testing of algorithms that uh, analyze data. So we need to take some of these into consideration to uh, to perform our testing properly. Uh, very common and few examples of machine learning. Uh, this is an example of li linear regression. Uh, in this case, we have all the data, the blue dots are the data and we want to generalize a function that uh, fits all the data. Uh, 
Uh, another very common problem is the classification problem. We have the data uh, divided into classes, and we want an algorithm um, to uh, divide the data properly, the data in, in, to do in the two classes we have. In this case, we have defined a um, hyperplane separation between the two classes. And another well-known algorithm, another well-known technique of machine learning is the clustering. Uh, the clustering problem uh, tells that we have uh, different data uh, distributed in the space, the blue dots, and we want to end up with an organization of the data like this, for instance. So we want, to, we want an algorithm that is able to identify the different groups in the data. Um, the first two uh, examples presented, of, uh, as many of you already know, are, are an example of supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning means that the pipeline uh, processing of a machine learning is more or less like this. We have data here, over there, and we transform the data into a feature vectors. Then we, this feature vectors is fed into the machine learning algorithm we want to, to, we have defined, we want to test. And then we have labels, this is the supervision part, that's why this kind of um, methods are called supervised learning. And after that, after we train the model, we want to exercise the model on the new data. So um, basically, machine learning means try to define a model that is able to generalize the conclusion. Um, and that's the key word. The key word is generalization. Um, this is the supervised learning setting. The unsupervised learning setting um, is something like this. So it's almost the same stuff. The difference is in the output, of course, and in the fact that the supervision is missing. So no labels uh, on the data are provided. So please let me just get back to the previous slides. In the, the output of the supervised learning model is the expected label. So we have an algorithm here that is trained on a set of labels, or on a set of given labels, so a set of uh, labeled data. And we expect the algorithm to um, generate uh, the exact label or the proper label for the new data coming after the training part. This is the supervised setting. In the unsupervised settings, the, since, the missing, since the labels are missing, the output is different. So, in general, we may have a likelihood or a cluster ID, which is the cluster or the group um, where the data uh, belongs to. Okay, um, so these are the general introduction of the, the techniques and the, the uh, stuff we are supposed to deal with. And second learn provides this kind of cheat sheet. Uh, it's a sort of uh, mind map that you can use to uh, decide um, which kind of technique you can use uh, for your specific problem. And this is quite interesting because, um, uh, as you can see, scikit-learn provides algorithms for classification problems. Uh, for clustering problems, for regression problems. So the three examples um, presented previously. And we have also that dimensionality reduction is another problem of unsupervised learning. Um, here you may find, uh, even if I don't know if you can read it, but um, here you may find some tips on how you can decide to uh, which technique you should use for your specific problem. For instance, if you have labels, of course, you may, uh, if you have labels, you may end up with regression or classification, so supervised learning approach. In case you don't have labeled data here, you end up to clustering uh, approaches because you don't have supervision. And this is just um, a very simple tip. But uh, even if you uh, decide which kind of approach you want to, to use, I mean, regression or classification or clustering, whatever it is, um, you are um, um, you're, you you need to decide which kind of technique 
you may use. Because classification is a family of uh, approaches. So the classification in, uh, itself is a, uh, is a kind of a, another, um, is an approach, uh, or a family of techniques. So um, you may decide which kind of algorithm and technique you should use. And after that, so basically you have to decide which model you're going to use. And after that, you have to decide also the set of param parameters that your model best, uh, uh, that, that should use for best approximate your result. So we have a lot of things to, uh, to decide. So basically, another definition of machine learning is machine learning teaches machines how to carry out tasks by themselves. It's that simple. And this, indeed. Uh, the complexity comes with the details. And in this talk, we're going to um, deal with this kind of details and try to, um, to see how we can deal with all the details we are asked to, to deal with. So, this is, is our, this is our starting point. So we have uh, the data, the historical data we want to use. We have decided which kind of model we want to use for our problem, and we end up with this pipeline process, this kind, this sort of iterative process, because we want to uh, test if the model we have built, so the, or the model we have decided to use, is perfect for the problem at the end. And we want to evaluate the performance of the model, and we want to optimize the model. So in this case, it means try to tune the parameters of the model in order to uh, improve the performances. So we want to, to deal with this, sorry, we want to deal with this uh, iterative process in this talk. And what about the risk, the, the risk related to uh, machine learning? We may end up, for, first of all, we may uh, end up dealing and analyzing unstable data. So we need to be robust against uh, data that may contain noise on the one hand. On the other hand, um, as I said before, machine learning is essentially algorithms. So we need to test if the, the code we already written contains fault or programming fault. We may end up with a problem which is called underfitting. The underfitting problem means that the learning function we decide to use, and sometimes this means the, the, the set of parameters we decided to, to set to our model, uh, is not properly uh, suited for our data. So the learning function does not take into account enough information. So the model is not accurate enough to learn from our data. This is called underfitting. Another problem is the overfitting, so the uh, counterexample, so the uh, completely different problem. We have taken, the, the learning function does not generalize enough. So uh, uh, this is a quite uh, difficult um, phenomenon to uh, discover, and we will see that there are some techniques to deal with this kind of problem. And finally, we have um, the unpredictable future, so we don't actually know if our, if our model is working or it's not working. So we need to check and test the performances of our model while it is running. Okay. So how to cope with this kind of risks? Uh, first of all, if we have, or we may end up, we want to reduce the, the problem of unstable data. We have testing. So we're required to do some testing to our code. If we want to avoid underfitting or overfitting problems, we have a technique which is called cross-validation. We will see some examples about that. And the unpredictable future precision or recall tracking over time. Do you know what, what, uh, what is precision and recall? Okay, I'll try to explain a bit. No problem. Okay, so let's start with the uh, dealing with unstable data. So basically, the, the, the point is try to test your code. And testing your code is one of the things that I suggest you to do uh, most of the time. Thank you. 
Uh, in Python, we have a lot of tools for testing. Uh, we have the great unit test module. And basically, unit test is based on a set of assertion. And the assertion, for instance, we have assert equal A and B that test if the instance of A is equal to instance of the object B. We have a lot of assertion. Um, the last column here in the figure refers to the uh, Python version where it has been introduced in the unit test. Um, let me just briefly remind you that the unit test module is a bit more um, um, extended, it's improved, enhanced in some time, uh, in some terms, uh, in Python 3 with respect to Python 2. And I will show you an example of that in a couple of slides. Uh, moreover, we have assertion to test the exceptions. We have the, the assertion to test warnings or at, uh, even assertion to test logs. And this is an example of how you can use the asset logs. So basically here, you test if the output of the log here uh, correspond to what you, um, what you expect. But uh, in case of machine learning, we need to take into, into, the, into consideration that basically we're dealing with numbers. In fact, one of the um, most important features in Scikit is that data are presented through uh, matrices. So, in general, we end up with having the feature matrix as X represented as a matrix of numbers, and we have labels that are basically num an array arrays of numbers. So here we have we have to deal with numbers. So. Uh, uh, the, the testing we're going to write, the test, the unit test we want to write, has to deal with number problems, and we need to to test numbers, and um, uh, we need to compare arrays or uh, floating point numbers. In this ca in this particular case, we have um, NumPy comes uh, in help. In, uh, NumPy. Um, I don't know if you already knew, knew that, but NumPy has a testing module that includes some more additional assertion. Uh, for instance, sounds a set almost equal, approximately equal, and some assertion related to array comparison. We will see a couple of examples. For instance, if you want to assert that two numbers are almost equal, we might use the assert almost equal assertion in the NumPy testing, uh, module, and we might specify the number of decimal positions we want to, uh, the two numbers are compared. So in, in the first case, we want to uh, test the number at the seven um, decimal places, so in this case the test passes. In the second case, since the, the, the least, the last digit, sorry, the last digit is different, so here, the decimal, place, the decimal places to take into consideration are eight. Uh, the test failed. So we have an assertion error here that says that arrays are not almost equal to the eight decimals. So actual and the desired. Okay. So uh, these errors are reported, and this is the, one of the things we need to uh, to take into account when we deal with floating point numbers. Uh, moreover, we may assert if two Arrays are equal. Uh, NumPy provides two different functions: assert all close and assert array equal. Here, uh, the assert all close function uh, implements this um, comparison. This function, uh, basically, um, we if we test um, assert all close takes to uh, some more additional parameters here. Uh, ATOL, which means absolutely absolute tolerance. RTOL, which is the relative tolerance, and in this case, the test will pass in, in, instead if we're going to use the assert array equal. These two arrays are different, and this is the assertion error we have. So the mismatches are 50%. Uh, again, if we want to uh, compare floating point numbers, we might take into, uh, into account the, the so called ULP, so the unit list precision, uh, which is the usually 
um, refer to the epsilon. Uh, if we want to, to, um, to know what is the epsilon for numpy and for floating point numbers in general, we may uh, get this by using np.finfo.apps. Uh, this is the, the epsilon, so the ULP for floating points, and in this case, if you want to test if two um, arrays are equal, in the first case the test passes because uh, we're going to, to verify, to, to check if two numbers plus the epsilon are equal. And this test passes because we're just adding one single epsilon and so the, due to floating point numbers representation this test passes. In the second case this the test fails because we're adding a quantity which is greater than the epsilon, so greater than the unit least precision and so the, t the two numbers are considered different. X and y, X and y are not equal to one, you will be max is two. Okay? And finally, NumPy testing is great because it's uh, also had some uh, had some more um, tools to deal with your testing. Uh, for instance, uh, it has uh, some decorators that integrates with NOSE, the NOSE testing framework. Uh, so, um, just an example, it, it has these um, these test uh, these test decorators. Uh, the the one showed in the slide is. Um, slow that allows you to decorate a function telling the framework that the, the, that test uh, is supposed to run slowly. What, may, what it means, it depends on uh, your uh, personal, your definition. Again, we have, uh, moreover, we have, sorry, we have the mock framework, which is included in the unit test of Python 3, and this is one of the features I was referring to when I said that the unit test module in Python, the built-in unit test module in Python for Python 3 is, <coughs> is a bit uh, extended, announced, with respect to the one in Python 2. Uh, in Python 3, you may do something like this from unit test input mock, and this works. In Python 2, if you try to import mock from unit test, you got an error, and if you want to use the mock, um, in Python 2, <coughs> you should do a pip install mock, which is a mock package available on uh, PyPy. And we see an example, the, the mock, uh, do you know what a mock is? Okay, so no problem. Um, basically here, we're, we define the function, a uh, class, which is nuclear reactor, that basically um, calls a function, which is the factorial, the factorial here um, prints the message, and this message is just used to uh, to test if the the actual code is exercised or not by the mock, and uh, calculates the factorial number of the n given an input. Uh, so this is the test. In the first test, we mock the factorial function, and in the second test, we don't. So this is the output. So um, here we have marked the output, so uh, we want to test the assertion here. <coughs> here, sorry, and uh, we got uh, working, which is the actual um, the actual code we exercised. In this case here, the do work, we assert that the output of the mark is six, but we have already defined it and no, no, no more message has been printed, so no mock has been printed here because the actual code has not been exercised by the mock, it's just been mocked. And in the second case we got an assertion error because we have here a factorial of three which is not supposed to raise any exception, so we have an assertion error here. So here we are exercising the real code, here we don't. Okay, is it clear? Okay, thank you. So, this is the part related to the uh, <coughs> this is the part related to the unstable data. Uh, what about the model generalization and overfitting? Uh, I don't have the time to explain the code. I'll just show you the example. Basically, the two the most important parts of this code are these ones because basically we randomly generated some data. 
here in this example, and we're trying to apply different uh, algorithms, in this case a linear regression algorithm, on these data uh, using different features uh, and the, the different polynomial feature in particular. And the different polynomial feature have been uh, generated by the polynomial feature here in the scikit package. And the different uh, features uh, have different degrees. So we try to apply features of degree 1, 4, and 15 and try to test what, the, um, what are the performance of this model. So this is the output. So basically, the, the blue dots are the, the data. And in, you, you may see in green the, the true function, and in blue the function approximated by the model. In the first case, we have a model which is uh, underfitted. In this case, the model defined, uh, so a linear model here, uh, a linear model with linear features, uh, is, um, uh, is not taking into account enough information. In this case, the, 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 we have a very good model, so it's perfectly suited for our test data. And in this case, the model is overfitting because it's trying to, um, it's trying to, so in this case, the, it, this is not a very good approximation, okay? So if we look at this um, particular case, okay, it seems that if we defined, uh, if we define a model with a polynomial feature of degree four, for this particular data, we are done. So we have the perfect model we may have. Indeed, this is not. Because this particular problem here, this particular uh, model, sorry, has been exercised only on training data. And the, the problem is, this model is, uh, in some sense, overfitted. What does it mean? This means that uh, if we consider just the training data, okay, we perfectly fit all the training data, but the model does not generalize any uh, does not generalize in any sense. Because if we if the model is going to uh, not really, <laughs> I'm going to conclude. Yeah, um, if the model uh, if the model um, will see some new data, the model is, has been too much trained on the training data, so no, generaliz no generalization is allowed on this model. So how we can cope with this kind of problem? The uh, one extremely important part in, this, in the module evaluation is, is to apply a technique just called cross-validation. And in this particular case, the, the um, psychic package helps us to, uh, with a lot of built-in function that allows us to apply cross-validation and model evaluation techniques. In this particular case, we, want, we apply a very simple cross-validation, which is called train and test split. So basically, we get the input data and we split the data into different sets. So we have the training sets and the uh, validation set, and we, um, we train the, the model on the training data and we evaluate the prediction performance of the model on the, the validation data. One kind of technique to, to see the uh, property, so the prediction property, uh, prediction performance of the model is the so-called confusion matrix. In this case, this is a uh, classification problem, uh, three classes by three classes, a multi-class problem. Uh, and we see that in this case, uh, we have three missed classes in this uh, classification problem. Um, another more, uh, another more um, complicated example is, but unfortunately I don't have the time to, to show you, is the, um, uh, this is an example of the K-neighbors classifier applied on uh, some data. Uh, so this, okay, uh, let me just to conclude with this. This is very interesting because we want to, um, to test the, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, we want to test the um, performance on the 
training data and on the cross, uh, on cross validated data. So uh, we uh, apply here the um, a function which is called shuffle split. So basically we get the samples. We have 150 samples. We, uh, these are the, the, the aforementioned functions to generate the true function, so the X and Y data. So as the regression problem explained before. And then we want to compare uh, the learning curve. So basically the learning curve is the uh, performance of the training score uh, with respect to the cross-validation score. And um, this is the cross-validation score for the degree four polynomial. So basically here we see that when we uh, enlarge the number of training examples we consider, the errors between the training and the cross-validation score is basically reduced to zero, so it's a very good model. And in case of a polynomial of degree one, so w which was the model of underfitting, uh, here we have uh, the, the error between the cross-validation curve and the training uh, curve that basically is even uh, is always large, so it's not a good model. Okay. Uh, finally, some conclusions. I have more slides, but I have no time to show you. I'm sorry. So basically, in conclusion, this is a uh, very important advice. You, uh, it's always important to have testing in your code, especially if you want to test numerical data and numerical uh, algorithms. Uh, another uh, suggestion I may give you just a hint, uh, some reference to, to look into, is something which is called FADS testing. FADS testing is very interesting for numerical analysis because some test, uh, FADS testing maybe uh, basically generates uh, randomly uh, applied data. So uh, the FADS testing technique is usually uh, used uh, to uh, test the robustness of your code. So in just to, 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 to test the uh, performance uh, of your algorithms in case of randomly uh, generated data. Okay, so thank you a lot for your kind attention. Thank you.